And if you remember in week one, we began this sermon series with a discussion of the Lord's table when he met with his disciples on the night that he was to be betrayed. He broke the bread and he poured the wine, he blessed it and invited them to partake. The second week we talked about having a place at the table. And the woman who came in with the alabaster box and worshiped Jesus and washed his feet with her tears and anointed him with the oil from the alabaster box. Last week, we talked about what do you bring to the table in volunteering in the kingdom of God and serving the church. Today, I want to talk to you about the greatest table gathering of all. The greatest table gathering in the history of table gatherings that has yet to come to pass. It's called the Marriage Supper of the Lamb. If you read throughout the Word of God, and in the vein of this idea of come to the table, you understand that all of the prophetic things that have been prophesied about the end times and about the coming Messiah and how he came and when he came and what he would do and where he would go and, and what would happen in the end times, this, this gathering is going to be the culmination of everything that Jesus Christ did, his whole purpose of why he was on this earth. And I want to kind of share this with you in light of Revelation chapter 19. Starting in verse 7, this is what the word of the Lord says. <clears throat> Let us be glad and rejoice and give him glory. For the marriage of the lamb has come and his wife has made herself ready. And to her it was granted to be arrayed in fine linen, clean and bright. For the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. Then he said to me, write. Blessed are those who are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, these are the true sayings of God. And I fell at his feet to worship him. But he said to me, see that you do not do that. I am your fellow servant and of your brethren who have the testimony of Jesus. Worship God. For the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of of prophecy. And I want to stop there. I want to take a few moments this morning to kind of unpack this scripture in light of come to the table and that we all have a place at the table and that we all bring something to the table. According to scripture, what will happen after the judgment seat of Christ will be a marriage supper that takes place. The marriage supper of the Lamb. In his vision in Revelation chapter 19, John saw and heard the heavenly multitudes praising God, praising the Lord, praising the Lamb, and, and because of this wedding feast that was going to take place. How many of you had a lot to eat over the last three or four days? Anybody have turkey? Anybody have ham? Anybody have armadillo? Okay, just checking. I don't, I don't know. <laughs> but you probably feasted on Thursday. Whether it was for lunch or for dinner, you probably sat with family or friends or somebody and ate together and spent time together. And you probably walked away from the table thinking to yourself, I am miserably full and need a nap. <laughs> this marriage supper of the Lamb, as John saw it in the Revelation, was about to commence. It was about to begin. And church, I want to tell you something here this morning. The marriage supper of the Lamb of God is about to commence because I believe we are living in the last days. And I believe that Jesus is coming soon. 
I believe that there's an expectation in the spiritual realm because they can just sense that the time is coming because of prophetic things that are happening and things that the word of God has, has declared would take place have taken place. And in the body of Christ, those who are attuned and those who are sensitive, you kind of have a feeling that it could be at any moment, it could be at any day that the Lord returns. And, and in this vision of, that John saw in Revelation, everyone was gathering at the table for the marriage supper of the Lamb. They were coming from far and near, all over the place. They were coming to the table. Can you imagine how big that table is going to have to be? A lot bigger than this one. And a lot bigger than the one we had out here last week. But the concept of the marriage supper is best, best understood in light of the wedding customs of the time that Christ walked the earth. They're a little bit different than they are now. And so to understand this idea of the marriage supper of the Lamb, we have to understand the wedding customs of that time. First, the wedding customs had three major parts. First, a marriage contract was signed by the parents of the bride and the parents of the bridegroom. And the parents of the bridegroom or the bridegroom himself would pay a dowry to the bride or to the bride's parents. He would pay a dowry. He would pay a price for the bride. And this began what was called the betrothal period, what we today would call an engagement period, when couples get engaged. This period was the one that Joseph and Mary were in when they found out that she was going to have Jesus. They were in this betrothal stage, the very first part of, of an actual wedding and marriage. And the betrothal period at that time was a binding legal contract of intent to marry. It was just as legal of a contract as the actual marriage. That's why when Joseph found out, the scripture says he was of a mind to divorce her or put her away privately because it was a binding marriage contract contract, uh, an engagement. And I want you to see this in light of what John sees in his vision as it contrasts with what the customs of that day were. Because right now, Jesus is not just a king. Jesus is a betrothed king. Jesus is an engaged king. And soon Jesus will be a married king. His betrothed bride is the people of God. The people who trust him, the elect from every nation and every race, the church in the earth is the bride of Christ. His betrothed bride is the people of God. And as I said, the custom of that day was there was always a price. There is always a dowry to be paid that the bridegroom would give on behalf of the bride. And the first time that Jesus came over 2,000 years ago, he came to pay that price. He came to pay that dowry. He came to offer everything he could, as it were, his blood as a dowry for his bride. And so began the betrothal period between Jesus and and his church, the engagement period between Jesus and his bride. And he will come a second time to marry her and to take us, his church, into the gardens and the chambers of his house. You see, this engagement period is where we as the church right now are. We are betrothed to the king of kings. We are in a waiting period for our groom, our bridegroom, to come. And in this waiting period, it's important that we keep our hearts pure and righteous and undefiled. 
Because the second step in this process of betrothal usually occurred a year or so after the betrothal began. After the first contract was signed and the dowry was given, that's when the betrothal period started. But then a year or shortly after, a year, a year, year and a half, somewhere in there, um, the bridegroom, the groom, accompanied by all of his male friends, would would take torchlights and they would basically have a parade from the groom's house to the, where the bride was living. And the bride, aware that the groom was coming, would have her handmaidens there with her ready to receive them. And then her knowing in advance, they would make preparations. This is the custom that was alluded to in the parable of the ten virgins. Let me read that to you real quickly. In Matthew chapter 25, verses 1 through 13, we're talking about the betrothal period and the end of the betrothal period when the bridegroom would come. It says this, Then the kingdom of heaven shall be likened to ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Now, five of them were wise and five of them were foolish. Those who were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them. But the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. But while the bridegroom was delayed, they all slumbered and slept. And at midnight, a cry was heard, behold, the bridegroom is coming. Go out to meet him. Then all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said to the wise, Hey, give us some of your oil, for our lamps are about to go out. But the wise answered them, saying, No, lest there should not be enough for us and you. But go rather to those who sell and buy for yourselves. And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came. And those who were ready went in with him to the wedding, and the door was shut. Afterward, the other virgins came also, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered and said, Assuredly, I say to you, I do not know you. Watch, therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour in which the Son of Man is coming. In this story of the ten virgins, we see an excited wedding party waiting for the bridegroom to come. But while he seemed to be delayed in his coming, some of them slumbered, some of them slept. Five of them didn't bring enough resources. They weren't oiled up enough. They weren't filled with the power enough to be prepared for when the bridegroom would come. And as I thought about that throughout this week and as I've been preparing this sermon, I thought to myself, my God, what a sad commentary on the body of Christ today. Because we can look around our world and see a lot of sleeping Christians a lot of slumbering Christians. We can see a lot of folks that have said, I'm waiting for the return of the Lord, but you don't see any oil operational in their life. Church, we are the bride of Christ. He is inviting us to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And there will be people in that day who will say, Lord, Lord, didn't I love you? Didn't I serve you? And he's going to look at them and say, depart from me for I never knew you. The bride in preparation for this moment had to make sure that she had everything ready and necessary for when the bridegroom came. She didn't know exactly when he was coming, but she had to be ready. And church, I want to tell you something. We're living in a day and an age where the bride needs to wake up and she needs to get herself ready. She needs to get herself prepared for the return of the bridegroom because if we're not ready, we're going to find out that when he comes, he's not going to even know who we are. There was no betrothal period. There was no engagement period because we let the oil run dry. Listen, we need a church that is filled with the oil of the Holy Spirit flowing through each and every pew, flowing through each and every home, flowing through each and every individual. The oil of the Holy Spirit that's transforming lives and preparing us for that moment when Christ returns. 
You see, there's an expectation in those who are awake and well-oiled. There's an expectation because we know that he's coming. Church, we know that he's coming. For those who are watching on live stream, I'm telling you this morning, he is coming. Get off of your couch, get off of your bed, and get ready because this could be the day that the bridegroom returns and takes us to that marriage supper of the Lamb. And we must be prepared. Because this is where we are right now. We're in that betrothal period. And the bride is waiting for the bridegroom to appear. And sometimes it seems like he's never coming. I've been, listen, I've been hearing for all 56 years of my life that Jesus is coming. And he's not here yet. It's been 56 years. But does that stop me from being excited of the fact that he is coming? No. In my eyes... He may be late, <laughs> but in his eyes, he's right on time. And eventually, I'll see he's truly right on time. He's truly right on time. Because only the Father knows the day and the hour. And there's coming a moment when he's going to look over at the bridegroom and he's going to say, it's time. Everything's ready. Everything's prepared for the wedding. Everything's in place for the marriage supper of the Lamb. Go and get your bride. Can you imagine that moment? Can you imagine that moment? I can just imagine that Jesus is sitting on the edge of his throne just waiting for that moment when the Father says, Go get your bride. Go bring them up here. It's time to party, y'all. But some in the church have gotten careless. Some are not prepared. I'm talking about the church at large. Some have not, are not prepared. They're not ready. They're, they're careless. They're distracted. Some are sleeping. My God, wake the church up in this day and age. Let the church be full of the oil of the Holy Spirit of God. So that when the bridegroom comes, our lamps are burning bright. This is the second phase of the, of the whole wedding ceremony and the betrothal and the, the bridegroom coming in. And what would happen is as the bridegroom would come down the road with his torch, it'd be almost like a parade to the bride's house. And when he got to the bride's house, he would receive her and all of them, the, the bridegroom, the bride, the, the best men, all of his friends, all of her friends and her handmaidens, all of them would make one processional back to the bridegroom's house. And that's where the bride would now live in the bridegroom's house. In the same way, Jesus is coming for the church. And it's going to be spectacular. It's going to be spectacular. When God the Father looks at Jesus and says, it's showtime. Let's make it happen to where every eye sees and every ear hears. And every knee bows. It's time. It's time. The third phase was the marriage supper itself. Which a marriage supper in those days could actually go on for two, three, several days. It could, it could go on. It was a, a long party. <laughs> and they would, they would have a marriage supper that could last three, four, five, six days. Maybe a week as illustrated by the wedding in Cana in John chapter 2. God bless you. In John chapter 2, God bless you. One more. Where, John, where Jesus performed his first miracle at a wedding in Cana of Galilee. And the scripture says that at this wedding, Jesus was there. His disciples had been invited. Mary, his mother, was there. And at some point during the wedding, they ran out of wine. Now, a host would always know to stock up well. If this was a party that was just going to last an hour or two, there would have been enough wine. But a party that was going to last two or three or four days... Sometimes it was hard to gauge. 
Sometimes it was, it, you didn't know for sure who all was going to be there and how much you were going to need. And it was an embarrassing thing. It was a humiliating thing for a host to run out of wine at a marriage celebration. And so when he did, he was mortified. And Mary, who was not even in charge of the shindig, comes to Jesus and she said, the host is out of wine. What are you going to do about it? And Jesus said, woman, what do you mean? What am I going to do about it? <laughs> this isn't my party. My time hasn't come yet. But Mary, full of faith that Jesus was going to do something, did not even take his rebuttal as, as something that she needed to address. She simply looked from him to the servants and said, whatever he tells you to do, do it. Whatever he says for you to do, make it happen. The scripture says there were six vessels there. And, and as, as, as many theologians believe, each vessel probably could carry 20 to 30 gallons of liquid. And Jesus looked at them and he said, fill all six of those. We're talking 120 gallons at least. Fill all of those with water. The scripture says that they, they obediently filled all of those. Now, let me just pause here for a moment and say something. I think that the church in this day and age needs to stop rationalizing everything and trying to understand everything on a human level. Sometimes logic, human logic, flies out of the window when Jesus is involved. Mary looked at the servants and she said, whatever he tells you to do, do it. It doesn't matter how foolish it seems, how crazy it seems, you do what he tells you to do. And I, I can just imagine those servants as they're filling up those, those jugs with water, thinking to themselves, perhaps, water? Really? We have guests at this party that are wanting wine, the best wine, and he's going to offer them water? This is crazy. Why didn't he tell us to take those vessels and go to the 7-Eleven and get some wine? I know they didn't have 7-Elevens back then. The Jiffy Mart. But oh, that we as the body of Christ in this betrothal period would hear the word of the Lord and simply obey. Simply do what he says. Scripture says that when they filled it and they brought it back, that they dipped some out. They took it to the host. Dipped some out. Took it to the leader. Dipped some out. And gave it to him. And he looked at the host and he said, why have you done this? And the host said, what? He said, why did you save your best wine for last? He said, most times a host of the party will put the best out first. And after everybody has drank and everybody is relaxed and easy going, then he brings out the watered down stuff and the less expensive stuff and the less good stuff. He said, but instead, you've used up all your wine and now you brought out the best stuff. He said, why? Can I tell you something? When you're down to your last and Jesus shows up and performs a miracle, he doesn't do it halfway. He doesn't do it watered down. He doesn't do it as the least. He's coming through in power and in might. And this is what was happening when Jesus performed his first miracle. There was a marriage supper that was taking place, a marriage party that was taking place. When John's vision pictures, what he pictures here is a wedding feast of the Lamb, Jesus Christ, and his bride, the church. As John the Revelator is on the Isle of Patmos, and he's already seen a lot of things in this vision of Revelation as he's written to the churches, and he's watched prophecy begin to unfold, and he's talked about seals, and he's, he's seen some really, really wild creatures. And now he comes to this moment, and the implication here is that the two, first two phases have already taken place. 
The first phase was completed on earth when Jesus gave his life and paid a dowry and every individual believer placed his or her faith in Jesus Christ. You became engaged to the king of kings. You became betrothed to the king of kings who right now we don't see, but one day there's going to be a processional to come and get us and take us to his house. He paid the dowry to the parent, God the Father, for his bride, the church. And the church on earth today is betrothed to Jesus Christ. And, and likewise, the wise virgin, virgins in the parable, all believers, we must be watching and waiting and ready. The second phase symbolizes the rapture of the church. The second phase when the bridegroom comes and he takes the bride to his house symbolizes when Jesus Christ turns, returns and catches us away and we go to be with him in what he has prepared for us. He said in the word of God, for I go away to prepare a place for you. During the betrothal period, the groom would prepare a place for his bride in his home. Jesus said, I go to prepare a place for you that where I am, there you may be also. We're going to be together one day and for forever. And the second phase was when Jesus returned to get the bridegroom. And I believe that the third phase is coming in, in that moment after the judgment seat of Christ when we are invited to sit at the table of the marriage supper of the Lamb. And all of a sudden, the wedding takes place. And that for which we have been waiting for years and years is now come to full culmination. And we are with the groom. We become married in that moment and for eternity to Jesus Christ. Because when you receive Christ, you become a part of the bride of Christ. And you have not just a seat at the marriage supper of the lamb table, but you are an honored guest because you are a part of the bride of Christ. When, when, a, when we have receptions now after a wedding ceremony, we have a special place for the bride and groom to sit. You're going to be sitting in that special place with the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And you're going to feast. And y'all, I don't know if it's going to be turkey and gravy and stuffing and cranberries and, and all of that stuff. I don't know if it's going to be barbecue and, and pulled pork and barbecue chicken and green beans and baked beans and all. I don't know what it's going to be. All I know is we're going to be with the Lamb of God forever and ever and ever. And so I say, church, get ready because he's about to call us to that table. He's about to bring us into that dining room. He's about to come back for us and take us home. And I am ready for that moment. I am ready for that. Let me bring this in for a landing with kind of a personal question. Do you believe in your heart that Jesus, the king of all creation, the king of all the universe, came into the world paid a dowry and betrothed himself to you with the price of his own blood and that he will come a second time to take you unto himself and to marry the church and we will feast with him forever in a beautiful place that he has prepared for his bride. If you believe that and you have received that and you are ready Make sure that the oil in your lamps stays bright. It stays full. It stays plentiful. Because you know what? This world can beat us up and beat us down. But Jesus already knew that. He said, in this world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer. For I've overcome the world. I've overcome. And today, I'm looking for that return of the bridegroom. I want the oil in my lamp to be full. I want to be ready in that moment that he comes. Will you stand with me this morning? I urge you, trust Jesus. I urge you, 
Love Christ with all your heart, soul, and mind. During this betrothal period, don't be unfaithful. Be a part of his bride. Be a part of his marriage supper of the Lamb. Now I know I'm talking to a room full of people that you know Jesus. You love Jesus. And so to you, to you I say, check your oil. Check your oil. Make sure. To those who may be watching online, maybe you don't know Jesus Christ. Maybe you haven't entered into a relationship with him yet. I want you to know he paid an awesome price for you. And he loves you. And he's preparing a place for you. Don't let that place sit empty for all eternity. Don't make his sacrifice in vain. Give your heart and your life to Jesus. It's simple. All you have to do is believe that he came. Confess your sins to him. Ask him to forgive you and come into your life. Ask him to transform you and create you in his image so that he is the Lord of your life. And then as you wait expectantly for him, it's not just a process of sitting down and waiting for him to show up. It's a process of preparing, getting ready, being ready by serving, by loving, by giving, by worshiping. All of it, all of it brings us to the table of the Lord. And on that final day when gravity loses its hold on us and he calls us home there's a place for you there's a place for you at that table there's a place that he has prepared for you your plate is there your portion is there everything so give your heart to Jesus pray over you today. Would you bow your heads and pray with me? Father, thank you for the opportunity to come to your table. Thank you for the privilege of knowing you. Thank you for paying a huge price, a huge dowry for me. Thank you for loving me, giving yourself and paying the price. Thank you for empowering us and giving us the oil of your Holy Spirit. As we watch and wait for you to return in this betrothal period, you have given us everything we need to overcome. You've given us the baptism of the Holy Spirit. You've given us the oil. You've given us the power to overcome. Let the church rise up in her identity in Christ as the bride of Christ. We are not weak. We are not anemic. We are not traitors. We are not imposters. We are the bride of Christ. Let the church rise up in her anointing, no matter what accusation the enemy may bring against us. Let us rise up in the power of our identity in you because we find our identity in you, Jesus. You're our groom. You're our husband. You're our king. We surrender to you today. chair to your table knowing that we you have provided everything we need to feast for our nourishment and our strength Lord we love you today we love you Jesus oh we worship you would you take a moment and just lift your hands and worship him in your own way
Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, Lord, I'm looking for you to return at any moment. I'm ready. Ready.
You know, there's coming a day when Jesus returns. The Word of God says that a trumpet's going to sound. And the dead in Christ will rise first, and then those who are alive will be caught up together with them to meet the Lord in the air. That's the wedding processional. That's the moment that the bride is taken away and is no longer in this world. A church, no eye has seen and no ear has heard the wonders that he has in store for us. We get a little bit of a glimpse from the descriptions that John gives us in Revelation, but we can't even begin to comprehend the glory of God. And it doesn't matter if their streets are gold or not. It doesn't matter if they're mansions or they're just rooms. What matters is His glory is going to be so overwhelming that the bride is going to be so enamored. It's going to be amazing. We're looking for that day. We're looking for that moment when Jesus returns. Are you? He has a lot of great things in store for us. And as we sit at that table with our crown of life on our head, feasting on the goodness of God, perhaps we're going to think it was worth it all. Every trial, every struggle, every bit of brokenness was worth it all in this moment because we have overcome. Amen? Amen. And so concludes our Come to the Table sermon series going to start another series on next Sunday, but I'm not going to tell you what it is yet. But I can't wait. We're, we're entering into the month of what we celebrate is Christmas. Celebrate the first time that Jesus came as a baby in a manger. And as we go through the month of December, let's, let's not let the power of that moment escape us. Sometimes we, we've heard it so many times and we get caught up in so many aspects of Christmas that the power of that moment of his breaking out of the supernatural and appearing in the natural in a manger sometimes loses its power and its effect on us. But as we go into this Christmas season, let's focus on Jesus. On Jesus. Let's focus on why he came. Amen. Amen. God bless you. I love you today. Shake somebody's hand, hug their neck, tell them I love you with the love of the Lord.